Um, my other role is um, the ophthalmology residency program director. So I'll also go over um, the different career paths in ophthalmology, including one of an educator, which we don't often get talked to about. Um, so um, as Nathan said, um, in addition to being the residency program director, I direct our eye trauma center um, at, at Hopkins and the residents are um, really um, are essential to the trauma center. And um, so, and you, you heard about my path. So I did do my medical school at Hopkins where I stayed for residency. Um, and then I did a cornea fellowship, which is a one-year fellowship. Um, and then I came back to Wilmer and I started getting involved in resident education immediately as the assistant chief of service. And that's basically somebody who spends one year um, with the residents um, taking care of eye trauma, staffing their cases. And then from that realized I was um, passionate about education and I um, became an associate residency program director um, and then residency program director, which I've been for, this is my fourth year. So, um, so we'll step back a little bit um, from education just to talk about um, the different subspecialties you can pursue in ophthalmology. Um, and then in, in the chat, if everyone could um, sort of just put, I, I see some of you have put your year of medical school, but um, you can just put if you're an MS2, um, one. Um, and so um, I think we have a, a mix of actually um, all the way to MS4. So um, I'll have things relevant for all of you. So as many of you know, we are a four-year um, residency. And it used to be that there was one year of internal medicine or surgery or a transitional year. And then that was at any institution you wanted. And then you did three years of ophthalmology residency. Now that has changed in the last um, basically several years. And now ophthalmology is what we call a um, integrated or joint program. So um, currently when you match in ophthalmology, you match for four years at the institution that you'll be at. So most of the time, like for example, at Hopkins, if you match with us for, for four years, you'll be at Hopkins. Um, other places, you could be associated with a community hospital, but the difference is that um, you, they'll tell you where you'll be, where you, you won't have the choice. Um, so that's so that's a change within ophthalmology. Um, and so we got rid of the preliminary year. And so after you do your integrated or joint um, fellowship, which most programs are integrated or joint with internal medicine or surgery, then you'll do your three years of ophthalmology. Now, the one major change was that in that integrated or joint internship, you do get three months of ophthalmology. So that was one of the major reasons why we made the change. So um, early in residency, um, we could have the exposure to ophthalmology. So you basically now get three years and three months of ophthalmology and hit the ground running as a PGY2 resident. Um, and then, um, okay, so I see in the chat. Yeah. And, and by the way, feel free to um, put any questions in the chat, which we'll have plenty of time for discussion after, after my presentation. So I mentioned we, our residency is four years and following residency, you can go right into practice and be a comprehensive ophthalmologist. Comprehensive ophthalmologists um, generally um, do cataracts um, and do comprehensive eye exams. For example, for patients with diabetes who need a yearly eye exam, they may follow some glaucoma and um, generally um, do surgeries. Again, cataract surgery would be the most common type. They could also do some basic surgeries, like I know some comprehensive ophthalmologists who do blepharoplasties, eyelid lips, um, and, and basic things like that. So, But then if you want to do a subspecialty, here are all the choices that you have. So um, probably our most common subspecialties are, um, I have it sort of listed. So retina is very common. That's probably the most common subspecialty that residents choose to pursue, surgical retina. And that's a two-year fellowship. Um, most of the fellowships are one year, again, except for surgical retina and oculoplastics. Oculoplastics is also popular, um, but um, limited in the number of spots. So it's pr probably our most competitive specialty. Um, for those, that's a good specialty for those of you who are interested in like ENT or plastics, um, but wanna, um, this is this is definitely an, um, an easier route to become a, an, an oculoplastic surgeon going through ophthalmology. So you enjoy sort of more micro, even more microsurgery than the plastic surgeon. Um, and so, um, and then there's glaucoma. Um, so glaucoma specialists not only do cataract surgery, but they do special um, specialized procedures for patients with elevated intraocular pressure for the optic nerve. Now, glaucoma, when I was a resident, um, it was very uncommon for, um, it wasn't as common as it is today. Now, there, there's been an explosion in what we call minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. So the surgical options for patients with glaucoma have been expanded, and they're, um, as you can tell by the name, they're less invasive. 
and associated with less complications. So now my residents are typically each, um, we have five residents at Wilmar per year. So my PTY4 residents, I usually have one or two going into glaucoma. So there's definitely been a change and a shift there. Um, and then cornea, that's my specialty. So that's um, always been popular. And, and then I'll talk a, a lot more about what a cornea specialist and the surgeries and the medical diseases that we see might be. But, but cataract is still bread and butter and probably the, is the most common surgery that most um, cornea specialists do, including myself. And then less common subspecialties, but equally important are on the bottom. So we have pediatric um, ophthalmology and strabismus, um, which is a one-year fellowship. And um, there's a shortage of pediatric ophthalmologists in the US. We've seen an increase lately. It's a wonderful specialty if you like kids and really can change the course of um, a child's life. And um, you do strabismus surgery um, and deal with um, other things like you can do cataract surgery on children, um, and amblyopia management, which is um, involves patching and, and prescription of glasses for kids, which is really important so that they don't develop a lazy eye. Neuro-ophthalmology is also a one-year fellowship, um, also not as common as the, as the others, but uh, and so there's a scarcity of neuro-ophthalmologists in the U.S. So if you're interested in neurology, this is a great field to consider. You'll be able to get a job anywhere. Um, you can be a surgical neuro-ophthalmologist or a medical one um, if you like more cerebral um, if you like neurology and are more cerebral, you don't have to do surgery, but you can operate. Neuro-ophthalmologists can do um, orbital surgery for like thyroid decompressions. They can do muscle surgery um, and they can biopsy tumors. So you, again, you can be surgical. Um, uveitis is um, also a uh, another rarer specialty, which is quite interesting and deals a lot with systemic um, diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis which can have um, uh, ocular manifestations, for example, of inflammation. Um, and then finally, pathology is the, is, the, is, the very, is the least common and is really a dying breed where we have um, ocular pathologists are, are scarce in the U.S. And mostly um, pathologists, now it's more common to be a pathologist and then take do some extra studies in, in the eye rather than being an ophthalmologist who's pathologist trained, uh, who's trained in pathology. But um, we do have an example of some ophthalmologists, for example, at Bascom Palmer, um, Dr. Debovi is a retina specialist and a um, ocular pathologist at Wills, Ralph, Ralph Eagle is one. We had one at Wilmer for many years, um, Dick Green, and um, currently our, uh, we have an ocular pathologist who's a neuropathologist by training. So so if anyone's interested in ocular pathology, again, you'll be highly, highly um, sought after. All right, so moving on to, to my uh, love, which is cornea. Um, it's, it's probably one of the uh, most rewarding of the specialties in, the, in that we have um, sort of instant results in, with many of our surgeries. Um, it's also very precise and our outcomes are um, outstanding. So um, as I mentioned, cataract surgery, um, which some of you may have seen is, is probably one of the most rewarding um, uh, surgeries performed in and is the most common surgery performed in older adults. Um, and so um, really you can change someone's life overnight. And when you take off the patch the next morning, um, they can be uh, extremely happy and their vision can go, for example, from being legally blind to 2020 um, by this su surgery, which takes on average about um, for a skilled cataract surgeon, about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and then we also do more complex surgeries. Um, the nice thing about ophthalmology is I mentioned um, there's lots of flexibility. So you can um, you can do more complex surgeries or you can choose not to. So um, we do, so like as a cat, as a cornea surgeon now, I do do some complex surgeries. Um, I mentioned my role as, as the um, director of the eye trauma center. So I do a lot of the trauma cases, traumatic cataracts, um, anterior segment reconstruction, um, suturing of intraocular lenses. Um, and so, and then when we talk about corneal transplants, these are extremely rewarding surgeries um, that um, some of you may have seen. There are different types, and it's evolved over the last um, 20 years to, from the most invasive, which is on the bottom, the penetrating keratoplasty, where you have to replace the patient's, all the layers of the patient's cornea and put 16 stitches in place or um, a continuous running suture. But um, that, we used to, that used to be the mainstay of treatment for Fuchs endothelial uh, corneal dystrophy, which is a, a dystrophy that affects the inner layer of the cornea known as the endothelium. And um, we used to wait till the patients pr got pretty advanced Fuchs in order to offer this transplant because it's, again, invasive and it takes um, 
uh, you know, it takes several months to heal. And also, um, if a patient falls after the full thickness penetrating keratoplasty, even 20 years down the line, they're at risk of um, losing dehis at, at any time. And at Wilmer, every year in our trauma center, we see, you know, an elderly patient falling and unfortunately having a dehis corneal transplant. So then um, less invasive options are shown here. So there's deep um, anterior lamellar keratoplasty, which is now the treatment of uh, choice in patients with keratoconus. So you're replacing all the layers of the cornea except for the endothelium. And then for patients with Fuchs with endothelial disease, it's evolved from DSEC, which um, is when you transplant decimase membrane and a little bit of stroma. And then even now we just transplant decimase membrane. So I'll show you um, how rewarding that the surgery of DMAC or decimase membrane endothelial keratoplasty is. Um, with these, with the um, you're just basically replacing the, the the layer that's affected, which is decimase membrane and the endothelium. And we're doing a 10 to 15 micron transplant. And um, at one week, the patients can have um, um, good vision. And then, you know, within a month, they can be 20, 2025 or 2020 without any correction. And there's um, no stitches often or at maximum one stitch. So quite a difference from the full thickness penetrating keratoplasty option. Um, in cornea, they're also doing research on injecting um, cells, um, corneal endothelial cells, um, as well as um, eye drops to um, promote cl clearing of the cornea. So lots of exciting research in the field as well. And um, it's all towards less invasive ways for patients to recover um, um, to recover their endothelial cells. So I'll show you a video of the um, of the DMAC and then, but I just want to talk about the last area, which is refractive surgery. So um, refractive surgery can be life-changing. Um, so the patient's not dependent on spectacles or contact lenses, um, especially patients with um, strong prescriptions who have needed glasses all, all, all their life. If um, there can be LASIK, um, photorefractive, um, um, photorefractive um, PRK, photorefractive keratectomy, or um, there are other more advanced uh, uh, refractive surgeries that corneal surgeons can do. So um, you can do all of these surgeries. You can choose what you want to do. Like I don't do a lot of refractive now just because of the way my practice is. I do more of the complex anterior segment uh, reconstruction after trauma, but you could, you could certainly be, um, you could certainly do lots of refractive surgeries and cataract surgeries if that's what you want. Um, and then we see a lot of di um, differences, difference med um, medical diseases. So we can see dry eye is probably one of the most common conditions we see in ophthalmology in general. In general, a cornea specialist will see more severe dry eye. There can be dry eye associated with autoimmune conditions. Um, we see infectious corneal ulcers, most commonly due to contact lens wear. We can also, we see all sorts of corneal dystrophies, which can be um, congenital and degenerations would come with come with age. And we can there can also be neoplasms of the conjunctiva most commonly more than the cornea. Um, neoplasms of the cornea are actually rare, but um, I do take care of um, tumors of the conjunctiva, including um, squamous cell carcinoma, conjunctival melanoma, um, lymphoma. So um, again, it's uh, quite exciting to be a cornea specialist. So I'm going to take a break to show the um, the video of the DMEC, and then um, I'm going to talk briefly about um, the path to apply, so you can get a sneak pre preview for the PGY um, for the MS uh, twos and uh, ones and twos. Um, so I want to can you see um, can you see my screen the video here? Um, we we don't see the video right now, Doctor. We're at a. Let me be sure. Okay, I think you should see it now. Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is a desk. Here we show you a DMEC procedure with a video edited to highlight the key steps. The technique used here was developed by Dr. Albert Jung, Chief of the Cornea Service at the Wilmer Eye Institute, and involves a pull-through technique. The first step is to prepare the special infusion forceps and to insert the forceps into the infusion sleeve carefully and completely so that the forceps tips can open and close and the irrigation is flowing through. Next, the cornea is marked for about eight millimeters in a region where the decimates membrane will be pre-stripped. A reverse Sinsky-like instrument is used to score and strip and remove the DM layer using the corneal marks as a guide. After this, a PI is made, though not shown in this video, at the six o'clock position, and the viscoelastic is removed from the eye. Gas is also prepared, as demonstrated in other videos, to the desired concentration, typically 20% SF6. 
So this patient has Fuchs, and you could see that um, decimase membrane and endothelium that was stripped, and we send that to pathology, and it'll show what we call gutte on the endothelium. So this is why they're having a DMEC surgery. Um, the most common indication for DMEC in this country is Fuchs corneal endothelial dystrophy. The graft is prepared by first staining with tripan blue for 30 to 60 seconds. This tissue came pre-tree fine from the eye bank. A small amount of viscoelastic is placed on the endothelial surface for protection, and then the graft is folded into a trifold configuration with the endothelium turned in and then loaded carefully onto a spoon. So we're lucky in the U.S. There's no shortage of eye banks. There's no shortage of tissues. Um, if you have, um, if you're rotated on like transplant surgery, you know there's a long waiting list for liver transplants um, and lung transplants. For for corneal surgery, there's no waiting list. So I can literally do a surgery for a patient next week and and get the tissue um, just in a few days. Um, and it's so it's cadaver. So patients um, donate their. Um, it's preserved once um, the patient is deceased. Will preserve the. Um, the cornea, the eye banks will harvest the tissue. Um, nowadays, um, you can really, um, they're preparing the tissue more and more. So you can see in this case, the surgeon actually folded the tissue. Now you can obtain tissue that's already folded, preloaded. So all you have to do is inject it in the eye. So there's also been a revolution in sort of eye banking in the US that's making it easier and easier to do these surgeries. The graft is then pulled into the eye using the infusion forceps. The infusion forceps are manipulated to ensure that the graft is completely inside the anterior chamber and then gradually opened and centered. This might require twisting the forceps side to side to facilitate opening of the graft and periodic bursts of fluid through the irrigation sleeve can be utilized to help facilitate opening of the tissue as well. Occasionally tapping the graft from the outside is helpful to facilitate centering. And so you can see we're dealing with a tissue that's about 15 microns in size, um, so it's quite delicate. And again, you can imagine the difference from what I talked about, where you would literally, like, a, use a cookie cutter, remove all the layers of the cornea and put an entire new cornea on. So you can see here, there are no there are no stitches that are placed. Um, and then how the cornea sticks, how the this, this um, decimase membrane sticks to the um, stroma is we put a gas bubble in the eye and then the endothelial cells will start pumping and then the patient again will recover much faster than with the um, traditional penetrating keratoplasty. Opening of the tissue. Gas is then injected under the graft into the anterior chamber for tamponade. Care must be taken to not move the graft in the process of injecting the gas. The gas bubble is then reduced using balanced salt solution to an appropriate tension. So again, very elegant, nowadays mostly sutureless um, and quick recovery for patients. So, all right, so now I'm going to move back into uh, my PowerPoint. Um, Okay, so, um, okay, so, and then again, because I, I just have a few trauma things. So this is like something I see not uncommonly where uh, somebody was at work and they get a foreign body in the, in the cornea. Um, um, it's superficial. It's very rewarding because the patient comes in with a lot of scratchiness and can't get any relief. And then we can remove this right in the office in about a minute and the patient gets relief. Um, so um, we, we do see um, infectious keratitis. I mentioned corneal ulcers. This is a patient that, um, walked into our emergency room at Hopkins um, and was an extended soft contact lens wearer, sleeping in her contact lenses, and she had a horrific pseudomonal infection. Um, is doing well now, actually. I did a corneal transplant and um, she regained vision, but um, we, we sometimes can um, deal with really terrible ulcers. Um, so uh, just a few words about the um, application cycle before we open it up for questions. Um, we are one of the few specialties that use the San Francisco match. So we don't use ERAS or the NRMP. Um, and it's basically just us in urology who are left using the SF match. Um, so um, overall, the we are a very we are considered a competitive surgical subspecialty. So the match rate for US seniors is about 80%. Um, 
Um, so it's if you're thinking about ophthalmology, it's good to explore it early so that, um, again, it's one of our more competitive specialties. We are what we can what is considered an early match. So our match, um, you, you may know the med school, um, most other specialties match in about in March, late March. Our, our match date will be uh, it's it's early February now. And the application should be in, in um, like by the first week of September, where um, the others are about a month later. One disadvantage of um, our using a separate match system is there is no couples match in ophthalmology. So for those of you with a significant other in ophthalmology, there you have to have um, special considerations and sort of um, vocalize that you're applying with a partner. Otherwise, there's no way for a program director to know. Um, so again, our match time frame now is that in early February, you'll know where you're going for your four years. Um, and then I mentioned the overall match rate for U.S. seniors is 80% 80, 80 overall. Um, and then the step one, the step score is less relevant, but we used to, um, step one used to be, I think, an important factor. So it used to be 247 matched mean for step one for, um, for um, um, and then versus for unmatched, which was 237. So, and again, I don't know how we're going to be using step two now, because this is the first year where we, re we really will be having most students with a step one pass-fail score. Um, so, but in general, for up to apply and successfully match an ophthalmology residency, you need two very strong letters from ophthalmologists. The third letter can be from um, um, you know, another medical um, medicine or surgery um, rotation. You do need research um, typically in, in ophthalmology um, and strong clinical grades. I know many of you are from medical schools with pass-fail systems, but the sub-I's are usually graded. Um, so we'd like to see honors in that. Um, there, there'll also be, um, we do put some emphasis on the personal statement and our um, our um, SF match got rid of the traditional personal statement and there's little questions that you can answer um, to try to um, see what you'll add to the program. So that's different. And then the interview actually, I would say is an important, once you get in the door, you're, I kind of think of all applicants on the same footing. So the interview actually does play an important role. And as I mentioned for step two, how we're going to use it as program directors is unclear because this is the first year where we have the pass fail. But I would say that um, a good score is won't won't hurt you. So I usually advise students if you have a step two score, uh, if you're a good standardized test taker and are going to get a step two score above two forty, then you can take it. It's and that can, that could be helpful. Um, if it's going to be below two thirty, that might actually hurt you. And then below uh, two thirty to forty is is neutral. It's not really going to help or or hurt you too much. And then, so this is the um, contact for our ophthalmology at Hopkins. So again, I'm the program director. Um, for those of you interested in education, I just wanted you to see that there are various levels of um, um, educational leadership. So we have a vice chair of education who oversees medical student, resident, fellow education. Um, we also have associate residency program directors, which is almost like a stepping stone to being program director. And as I mentioned, I did that for five years becoming before becoming the residency director, it's great to give you sort of an idea of what the job entails and if it's something that you think you would want to pursue being the actual residency program director. And then um, many schools have, oh, all schools have a clerkship director or they may call it a medical student educator. So they're responsible for the curriculum um, for the medical students. Um, and that's a, also a, a great role where you can influence um, um, and mentor uh, medical students and it's very rewarding. All right, so I want to have a time for questions. So I think we have about 25 minutes. So please feel free to unmute yourselves or um, put the questions in the chat. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Retta. Um, I think I speak for everybody when I say that was super informative. Those cases were really interesting and I really appreciate everything you were saying. Um, in terms of some logistics for the questions, just since we have so many folks here in the Zoom call, if you would go ahead and raise your hand um, or type your question in the chat um, and then I will Kind of shout you out and you can have the chance to pose your question to Dr. Loretta. Um, I see Sanan already has his hand up. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you for that talk. Uh, I just had a question about research and your experience recently, especially with COVID. Um, how, how has your experience been in terms of your subspecialty? Has there been anything that has um, you know caught your attention that you found interesting? Uh, you mentioned uh, the, the DMEC and the transplants like that. I've come across in, in solid organ, organ transplants that COVID may have an increased risk of rejection or you know, related types of things happening. Have, have you seen anything like that in transplantations in the eye? And if so, uh, like, how, has that impacted your practice? 
Yeah, great question. Uh, I think there have been some case reports of uh, rejection. So one of the risks of corneal transplantation is rejection. Fortunately, um, it's because the cornea is an avascular tissue, uh, our rejection rates are low, um, but they are highest for the penetrating, the full thickness penetrating keratoplasty, and they're lowest for the DMEC. So um, if, unlike other organ transplantation, when you because the cornea is avascular, when you do have a corneal transplant, a lot of patients ask, do I need you know, lifelong immunosuppression? Um, and the answer is um, they don't need systemic immunosuppression for most type of corneal transplants. The one exception will be uh, limbal stem cell transplants. Um, sometimes those patients, if it's from, uh, if it's not like from the other eye, they do require immunosuppression. But for, um, for, for the ones that I showed you, it doesn't require, um, because the risk of reject, because it's the cornea is avascular, it doesn't require systemic immunosuppression. You use topical steroids to treat um, uh, after the transplants. And for uh, corneal, full thickness corneal transplants, you can treat with topical steroids for forever. So a patient, you may see our patients on like once a day, topical prednisolone acetate. That's not uncommon. For DMEC at one year, sometimes patients can discontinue their steroid altogether. So with COVID, we did find there's some case reports of, or even with vaccination, there's been, there's been, um, with vaccination, there's been um, a little bit, uh, there's been a few case reports of like rejection after the vaccination. So I think it's just something we carefully watch. And fortunately, most episodes of rejection can be just treated with increasing the topical steroids. So so I would say that's the only the thing, it's more associated with the vaccination rather than um, COVID itself. And then again, rejection is, is treatable. So it, it's um, something that hasn't really affected my practice or, or the volume of corneal transplants I'm doing. All right, uh, Saima Khan, do you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Sure, um, and also you pronounced my name like perfectly correct and that was amazing because that never happens. Um, so I'm, I'm Saima, I'm a um, third year medical student from Dell Medical School. Um, I'm also one of the co-presidents for Opto Interest Group um, this year. So I noticed um, you are the director for the eye trauma um, at JHU. And that's something I'm really interested in. And that's something that I've heard from um, some of our students that they're also interested in. But I haven't noticed a lot of opportunities to get involved in uh, trauma. It's not a specific fellowship. Um, so how do you have any advice for students or any advice during residency selection about how to have more exposure? Yes, absolutely. So actually, um, you know, Wilmer, we used to have our own IED. There's there's only four eye emergency rooms uh, left in the country, and that's at Mass Eye near Bascom Palmer, Wills, and University of Alabama at Birmingham. So now we're integrated into the main ED. Residents across the country are involved in the emergency care of, um, of patients. And so most, like for example, at most hospitals, it's the residents who are taking the either at home or like in our program, in-house call. So so as a resident, you'll be very involved with taking um, care of emergency and trauma patients. Um, for us, we're a, a, a designated eye trauma center for the region. So we do take care of, we have a lot of um, patients being with open globe injuries, lid lacerations, orbital fractures that we see. So when you're looking and applying for residencies, you can you know, ask about the trauma volume. And then the other thing I would encourage you as a medical student, we do have the American Society of Ophthalmic Trauma, which... Um, I'm actually the president of, and that um, we welcome med student members and resident members. So you can certainly join and we have um, lots of initiatives and have an annual meeting um, to discuss um, uh -huh. um, ophthalmic trauma. Now it kind of is because trauma is, it's, it's not, really thought of as its own subspecialty in the US, but, and so it, it, it kind of spans all subspecialties. So even if you're interested in retina, oculoplastics, cornea, neuro-ophthalmology like there, you know, we should all be, um, you know how to manage uh, trauma patients. And so um, I would encourage you to, um, to join our society as well. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, I think Mara there's a question in the chat as well. Um, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Or, but yeah, we'll, we'll do maybe one more and then maybe you can ask some from the chat so that we can um, address some of those as well. Yeah, sounds great. Um, Mara Crispin, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, um, so I was actually wondering, there's been a recent change on the second year at a um, DO school, an osteopathic school, PCOM. 
Um, and I was curious, there was a new change where you can take step two without taking step one. So I guess in my case, that would be beneficial. So I, since they're both pass fail, I could just take my level one complex exam, but then later takes both level two and step two since they're scored. So I was wondering if there was any disadvantage with that. Um, good question. So for for um, for DL students, I, so I, I mentioned for U.S. allopathic seniors, the match rate's eighty percent. If we look at DL students, it's actually much lower. So I do agree that we you need to think strategically and really um, get advice in in the process um, because again, I, I I can't think of it off the top of my head the match rates, but it's it's significantly lower. Um, so I would say that you definitely need a step two score and you want to really um, have an excellent step two score. So I would say I would even say like two forty five or above just to really distinguish yourself just because the rates of matching are, are, are lower. Now, we are encouraging um, programs not to, uh, you know, to do holistic screens and not just, um, you know, sort of focus on things like scores. But I, I do think a, a, a good, uh, an outstanding step one score for a, a DO student is um, will, will help them in, uh, increase their chance of matching. And, and as I mentioned, and I'm happy to put my email in the chat, feel free to email me. But I do think, so our, um, our, our sort of three categories of, um, of students with less, uh, with lower match rates are one, um, DL students. Um, the second is um, international medical graduates. And the third is reapplicants. So any of anyone in this three, I, I do say like talk, talk to us, talk to as many program directors, you know, and talk to everyone at your school because the match rates are significantly lower for, for those, for our th these three buckets. Thank you. Sure. Perfect. Um, a question from the chat from Jean. Um, she says, thank you for the lecture, Dr. Loretta. Um, and what do you love most about practicing at Wilmer? Um, it was a great question. So I, I do find that actually I did a recent study with one of um, my Hopkins med students, and we found that about 40% of it varies per institution, but anywhere um, from like 30 to 70 percent of faculty stay like trained at that institution either as a um, resident fellow we didn't look at med students but I do feel like when you're picking places to train um, you, you know a lot of times you're picking them based on the characteristics and you're, you're you're likely you could be likely to join faculty so I think in my case that's true so I did I did my medical school at Hopkins and then I felt it was a very um, a collaborative environment. I felt very supported. And so um, after residency, um, when, even when I went off to fellowship, I knew I would be coming back. So um, I think it's collaborative. I think there's lots of, uh, I mentioned uh, my interest in resident education. So there was a huge focus on that, um, where we have like an endowed professorship just to um, to fund the position of the program director. I felt like my education interests were, were fostered there. Um, and then I then became the director of the trauma center. So again, this complex tertiary care pathology, I enjoyed Enjoyed doing it, but I would say um, a collaborative environment where I felt um, supported and nurtured was probably the the reason that I'm still there. And I also enjoy um, interacting with the trainees um, a lot. So that's probably um, the main driving factor keeping me in academic ophthalmology. I didn't talk. I ran out of time for my talk, so I didn't talk about the different paths. But this is probably something I didn't understand as well um, when I was. Um, a medical student, but you know, there's you can do 100% academic ophthalmology like myself, um, and even within that, there's so much you can do. Like you can be a 80, 20 percent, uh, like 80 percent researcher, 20 percent clinician, 50 percent clinician, 50 percent research. You can be an educator like me, so doing 50 percent clinical, 50 percent education. There's like a lot of things that you can do un under academic ophthalmology. You can also be 100 percent um, clinical clinician in private practice. You can do industry. You can do a hybrid. Um, so there's just lots of uh, different career paths within ophthalmology. Uh, we are an industry heavy field. Lots of innovations, you know, in all fields. I mentioned I talked about cornea, but there's lots of innovation in glaucoma, retina, plastics. Um, so, yeah. Great. Thank you, Dr. Ritter. Sure. Awesome. Um, another question from the chat from Matha from UTMB. Um, she says, thanks, Dr. Waretta. What are some of the biggest challenges you see in global health um, when it comes to corneal diseases specifically? Great question. Um, and recently, actually, the um, American Academy of Ophthalmology um, which is our national organization for ophthalmologists, um, 
had had a global ophthalmology summit. So I, you know we um, and they um, they're actually having their second summit next year in um, in Atlanta. So I think global health is and um, is one of the reasons I went into ophthalmology because it's so amenable to for the, for those of you interested in global health or international health. And so um, corneal disease um, is is challenging. I mentioned in the U.S. there's no um, tissue supply restrictions or shortage, where in other countries there are definitely um, shortages in terms of eye banks, um, and even when their eye banks um, having enough tissue for the surgery. So, for example, when I went to Ethiopia after um, my cornea fellowship, um, th there's a year or longer wait list for a corneal transplant. Um, then there's also issues of training. So that you know, um, in many um, uh, con developing countries, there, the access to um, surgical um, training programs like a cor one year cornea fellowship are actually scarce. So, um, and there's a number of reasons for um, the, the, the lack of tissue um, in terms of the infrastructure, also um, tissue donation. So there's, there's a lot of things that, um, that can be addressed in terms of corneal blindness um, in the developing world. So for those of you interested in global health, diabetic retinopathy is an epidemic everywhere. Glaucoma is a huge problem in, in the developing world. Um, in, uh, mature cataracts are uh, and uncorrected refractive errors are um, major causes of, um, of, of blindness in the developing world. So um, so ophthalmology is a great field for those of you interested in, in international ophthalmology. And specifically, again, cornea, I think corneal blindness is the most common cause of um, vision impairment outside of cataracts and uncorrected refractive air. So, um, and um, so I think it's, it, there's lots to do it. Another thing I didn't mention, like there, there are a lot of non-invasive options now, for example, for keratoconus, which is a condition where the shape of the cornea, um, it becomes ectatic. Um, uh, um, there's a cross-linking, which was FDA approved in the U.S. about three or four years ago, and it's been done in the U.K. So access to that in the developing world is, is also rare, and that prevents uh, progression. So a lot of issues with access um, and equity um, re regarding different therapies. Contact lenses, for example, we take for granted in this country, but special contact lenses for keratoconus can always be, can't always be obtained abroad. So so lots of challenges. And, and um, for those of you interested in, in it, the AO, again, has a global task force and a meeting that um, I, I met many medical students at. So something to look out for if you're interested in, in international ophthalmology or global health. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dr. Beretta. I think maybe one more from the um, Zoom participants, and then we'll do some of the pre-submitted questions, just to be fair to those who also sent theirs in ahead of time. We'll get some of those, too. Um, Zara from U Miami, do you want to go ahead and ask your question quick? You also said my name correctly, so thank you for that. Uh, hi, Dr. Rada, good to see you again. So see my you. question is about your role as director of the Eye Trauma Center. I touching on kind of what you said earlier. I think that it's very valuable to residents that have an emergency department on their facility or as part of their program. And as someone on the interview trail right now, that's something I really look for. But if I end up at a program that doesn't have the opportunity, what is a way? that I could kind of end up in a role similar to that where I get to work in med ed and, and trauma or something related to that if I don't end up at that type of program. And could you share a little bit more about how you got to that position specifically? Sure. Yeah, I think mine came directly out of uh, like, so at Wilmer, we don't have a chief resident, but we have this position, which is um, a little bit unique where some 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 programs have like a, a assistant chief of service position, but you're actually an attending and you come back and work with residents. So some programs, Mass Eye Near, um, it's right out of um, residency that some people do like a chief year. Um, and uh, I think there are a couple others in the country, but for us, it's actually after fellowship, they ask us to come back and spend a year with the residents. And that year was all trauma. Um, so that's how I became interested in both trauma and um, resident education. Now, I do think for, for um, any program, Again, residents of, for, for ophthalmology, one, one reason some people go into almost some might pick ophthalmology is it's a lifestyle specialty. So, you know, even, um, you know, as a cornea specialist, I feel like I, I rarely go in for emergencies. Occasionally, if there's like a corneal perforation that can't be glued and I need to do a transplant with the fellow I'll, I'll, or the resident, then I'll go in. But I really don't go in a lot after um, after hours or on the weekends um, for cornea. Some special retina, you, there are more retinal detachment emergencies and oculoplastics. It's busier. But again, for cornea, our call is very light. So 
So one reason that um, some people choose ophthalmology is again, compared to other medical subspecialties, you know, it, it is considered a lifestyle, but I would say that, so in general, ophthalmologists don't like to take calls. So the residents do though. So I feel like at many programs, the residents are the ones taking all the emergency calls. So although you might not get a large volume of trauma per se, you'll get emergencies. And there's this new um, movement for um, among ophthalmologists um, in terms of hospitalists. Um, so there's like this new uh, uh, ophthalmologist uh, ophthalmic hospitals interest group that's been developed um, by um, KCI Institute um, in New York. Um, and so and so they they deal with ophthalmic emergencies in the hospital. So even if you don't get the trauma, you'll still get to work with emergencies. And again, I think pretty much all residencies um, are, are accustomed to um, the residents work, working with um, faculty to take care of patients with, for example, ulcers, retinal detachments, all kinds of um, emergency ophthalmic care, because again, residents are, are usually um, at the forefront of this. Awesome. So one question that we had submitted ahead of time um, asked if you could share your perspective and uh, perception of work-life balance in the field of cornea, um, and then also um, how that's evolved for you over the course of your career and what things were important to you when, when creating that balance for yourself. Yeah, so again, I think ophthalmology, I think it is a field that's a very amenable to work like balance. Um, I remember, so when I was a medical student, I was kind of considering OBGYN and ophthalmology. And then like every ophthalmologist I met was like, super happy and, and not so much with the OBGYN. So again, it's a great field for, for balance. Um, most of there's not that many eye emergencies that have to go in the middle of the night. There's just a couple. So um, for cornea, it's essentially none that go in the middle of the night. So most things can be taken care of during office hours. Um, so I would say the work-life balance is, is, um, is excellent. Now, if you go into academics, there are, uh, or, or, you know, private practice, you can, you know, sort of titrate your level of busyness. Like um, I keep busy with um, academic um, pursuits, like um, research with medical students and residents. And, um, you know, I think we're like, we're in application review season. So I have 615 applications to review for my, um, for my five spots. So, you know, there's different things you can make yourself less or more busy, but I would say like the number of um, hours I'm spending taking care of patients on the nights and weekends is limited in, in cornea in general. Great. And even um, ocular plastics, I mentioned you can, you can get to, you can go through plastic surgery or you can go through ophthalmology and it's much, it's a much easier path if you go through ophthalmology um, in terms of like the training, the number of years, the rigor of the training and so forth. Another question we had kind of in the bigger picture um, asks how you sort of see the field of ophthalmology over the next 10 or more years in relation to some other factors, including optometry as a field, um, insurance, private insurance, trends in surgical procedures. Um, I guess anything you see maybe changing in the field over the course of um, our potential careers. Yeah. So apparently, and I, you know, optometry, the, this scope, um, there's been like a scope battle between ophthalmologists and optometrists and our American Academy of Ophthalmology is super involved in, in that scope battle. Um, so I think, I think we're doing a great job. I mean, every year they have like a, um, advocacy. Uh, it's every year in DC, our American Academy of Ophthalmology has like an advocacy day. So for example, if, if you're interested in advocacy and, and uh, that's something where you can become really involved in, um, there's state societies um, for like for uh, Maryland, it's like um, it's called MSEPs, where um, you know a lot of um, the leaders are are leading some of these key scope battles. And in California, I, I think you, some of you may have seen in the news, there was some scope battle. I think it was about um, lasers and and um, when ophthalmology wants so I do think um, advocacy for our profession is important private equity I think that's a that's a um, trend that we're seeing it across all subspecial all specialties right like my husband's a gastroenterologist and um, most many of the practices when he interviewed they were private equity owned so that's a trend that's not unique to ophthalmology and then as I mentioned technology is evolving it, it, we're one of the fields where for example, now a lot of times people do laser assisted cataract surgery, the types of intraocular lenses that we can offer our patients every year. There are new ones in terms of um, trying to achieve uh, less spectacle dependence and uh, um, increase patient satisfaction. So I do, and so I think we're a high, um, there's always new surgical equipment. Um, and so we're, uh, like I mentioned, for those of you interested in industry, I have some, some residents out of Wilmer do end up in industry and innovation. So that's something um, I think exciting about our field. 
Great, and then one more from the pre-submitted questions. Um, this one's a little more specific to students as they're applying. Um, the question asks, um, what advice do you, would you have for students that students don't normally think to ask about? Or maybe put a different way, is there something that as you're having conversations with students as they're getting ready to apply, um, you feel you're commonly sharing with students that they should be thinking about? Yes, I think, and so there was a question which I, I do get a lot and I advise students on about the research. So I think like some fields like neurosurgery, you have to take a year off and do research. That's not necessary in ophthalmology, but we do like to see that because again, it is a competitive field. We do, uh, research is one way to distinguish yourself. So sometimes we'll see a student is like, clearly destined for another field and you'll see they switch to ophthalmology which is totally fine that doesn't necessarily mean you need to take a year off but as soon as you know you're interested in ophthalmology you should try to um, obtain some research opportunities and by research I mentioned different I mean it's not you could do um, education research it can be clinical research it can be case reports like you, you just need some evidence to show dedication to the field so there's a question about how many publications and this is a question I get a lot how many publications do you think are good enough not to consider a research year. So I would say that um, sometimes the students get overboard and they're trying to have like 10 publications. That's that's not really needed. Um, so I would say um, it's quality over um, quantity. And then also like if I see like one first author publication ophthalmology, like that's more than enough. And more importantly, when you come to interview, being able to talk about it and, and from like start to finish, showing that you had ownership of the project, knew exactly what's going on and saw it from beginning to end is more important. Sometimes you'll see students with like submitted in progress, submitted. And so too many of that is also a red flag that you're not able to finish. And another, some sometimes I hear the faculty saying, well, the student couldn't talk about the project at all. So they didn't know their own research. And that could also be pretty uh, the kiss of death during an interview. So you really want to take ownership of the project. And if you think about it, like, so the faculty may initially give you the idea. And if you have ideas, you can certainly um, bring them to faculty. Um, and, um, but once you have the idea, like just run with it, you know, and then do all the research on it and think outside, you know, like in other words, don't just do what the um, preceptor tells you, kind of think about it yourself critically and bring up you know, new ideas and, you know, critically um, challenge the, the preceptor too, because that's always um, impressive. Great. Um, so we have just a couple minutes left. I think, um, Dr. Red, if you're okay with taking a couple more questions and then we'll get everybody out of here on time. Yes. Um, Absolutely, Nick. And I'll, maybe I'll just try. There's a couple questions in the chat that I'll try to answer quickly. One is, hmm. I was wondering if MD PhDs have the option of pursuing a research year after internship. Um, so I would say not not really, um, but because of the four year structure now, there's less flexibility there. But I would say MD PhDs. Um, at places, highly academic places where they're were very sought after. For example, like I don't think there are a lot of MD PhD applicants out there. So places like Wilmer, for example, um, love love that. Um, but you can even though there's not a year that you can take off, there are things that you can do to prepare yourself during residency. And like the internship I mentioned, you get it's the internship in general is um, because there's three months of ophthalmology overall you can um, use that and you'll be at the same institution so you can use that year to kind of um, learn how to set up your um, career as a physician scientist um, and so we've had um, residents work in the lab throughout the, the residency um, a lot of programs have elective times there are also um, some programs for physician scientists like at Hopkins which are not year-long programs but they're programs that you can take um, like throughout the training so I think that that would and then I think the most important thing is to think about the mentor um, because when you the mentor in the field that you're interested in because if you start thinking about it as a resident thinking about the research ideas as soon as you finish um, your residency and even during fellowship, then you can think about the early career grant support. We didn't have time to talk about um, grant support, but you definitely, if you want to be an um, academic um, physician scientist, you definitely want to think for grant uh, about grant support because there, there are lots of opportunities av available early in your career and the first five years, and you don't want to miss them by, you know, not knowing that there these opportunities are present. For example, mentored career awards are, I mean, you can actually get them anytime, but I think during the first um, five years is the most common time to get these awards. So you want to kind of know all the different pathways. And there are, you know, you'll learn this as you go through ophthalmology. There's something called the HEED retreat, which gives um, different careers in academic ophthalmology from being a physician scientist to being an educator, to being like an administrative leader. So um, you can get familiar with all of these. Um, 
good. And then I one question about away rotations. Um, how important are away rotations? In ophthalmology, it's actually like I heard in neurosurgery, for example, that you have to do at least a certain number of away. In ophthalmology, it's not as important. And most students actually don't um, who match with in our program, for example, haven't done the away. Um, that being said, if you're really interested in the program, um, it it can be a it, it can be a great opportunity. And um, as I mentioned, like for Wilmer, we have um, 615 applications for um, five spots. So, you know, if I if you you know if you have a real interest in the program, and um, I think doing it away, getting to know us is is great. But it's just it's not it's not mandatory. And again, most of my residents, like currently, um, I think um, no. No, no one of my residents currently did a did a um, in person away. Some did a virtual elective we had, but no, no actually did the away. So it's not it's not necessary. But you know it, it, you can think about it and sort of talk about it with your mentors to see that, for example, if you have a significant other and really have to be in a in a location, it can be a good way to um, to get to know more about the program and distinguish yourself. I see a couple of hands still up. Yeah, I was thinking we'd hit Muhammad's question and then Hassam's and then wrap up. Mohammed, go ahead. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm a first year medical student and I've been trying to get as much shadowing experience uh, as I can. Um, but how do you like, aside from like observing, um, how do you like truly see that the field is for you? Because I've seen that the procedures are so specific and it seems much more like an art at times. So how does one truly find out whether the field is for them? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and I remember, you know, being a medical student, kind of uh, thinking about this, because you do a lot of observing in ophthalmology, as you mentioned. And sometimes, like, you, I, I shadowed a retina specialist who saw, like, 50 patients, and, you know, it can be overwhelming. Um, so I think um, oftentimes in the summer between your first and second year of medical school, um, many people have, like, a research year, um, sorry, research month or four to or six to eight weeks or so. So I would say use that wisely, um, but consider doing research in ophthalmology. And then also, you know, use that time to um, sort of build continuity with. And so like maybe like, for example, um, I sometimes I have students join me in the OR every uh, Monday for during the summer. So then you can get more um, exposure to the types of cases we do. Now, microsurgery, it's it's definitely um, delicate. So some places have like wet labs, like, for example, at Hopkins, we have a wet lab. And sometimes you can go in there and look under a microscope and, you know, learn how to set your pupillary diameter and see if you like working in a, a microscopic setting like I have a twin sister actually who's a gastroenterologist and I remember she did research in ophthalmology her first year and then you know she ultimately she said it was too microscopic and and now she does GI which is macroscopic but you know so you can get an idea whether you like the delicate microsurgery go to the wet lab um, look try to get to the um, the side scope of the microscope and see if it's something you enjoy like I enjoyed the precision um, of, of the cornea surgery so but then, and you know, at the end of the day, it's uh, I talked to lots of ophthalmologists, and again, I saw the career satisfaction was you know re was really high. So, um, at the end of the day, um, I, I that's why I, I, in addition to the international ophthalmology and the high career satisfaction. That's why I chose it. Um, and then I mentioned, um, you know, there's a lot of different things you can do in ophthalmology. Like I know some people, I know some people who ended up not liking surgery and you can be a medical retina specialist where you don't do any surgery, or you can be a neuro ophthalmologist where you don't operate. Or if you like to operate, you can do a surgery heavy specialty. So I do kind of think that, you know, there's something for, for everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Sure. Great. Hassam, you want to wrap us up? Yeah, thanks, Nick. Uh, thank you, Dr. Warata, for the great talk. Uh, as always, it was a pleasure. And then I just have a quick question uh, regarding letters of recommendation. Um, I know the general consensus that I've heard from a lot of program directors and faculty has been at least two uh, letters from ophthalmologists. And then the last one's always like a toss up from some. I've heard that you should try to have a third ophthalmologist from others. I've heard you should try not to have an ophthalmologist, uh, as in like both ways, like some people feel very strongly. Um, so how do we tackle that going into the application cycle? And what are your own thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So great question. So the reason I say just, I usually say for two for ophthalmology is because the ophthalmology letters tend to be 
more research-based. Um, now, you can shine in the clinical setting in ophthalmology, but it's just not as easy as internal medicine or surgery, for example, because like our our exams are so specialized and our clinics are so fast-paced. So, you know, although, um, you know, you can notice if a medical student is doing a great job in terms, in terms of being helpful, you know, get um, uh, making a, uh, get establishing a rapport with patients, it's hard for them to really wow us with the presentation, right? Because they're pretty, we're pretty, you know, it's pretty short and focused and, you know, and again, you know, you're, it's hard to like impress subs specialist. So I would say, you know, like um, being proactive about reading about the patients you've seen, um, finding opportunities for like a case report or research is, is the way to distinguish yourself. So they tend to be kind of um, more, less clinical, but but I mentioned there is the internship. And so, um, and then as a sub I, you can certainly distinguish yourself in terms of your, you know, how you are with patients, um, you know, uh, follow up, you know, you know own, ownership, all that stuff. So that's why I think that letter is important. So I usually say, so we usually recommend, I usually recommend to the students to try to do a sub I in either, you know, uh, medicine, if you're interested in surgery um, or PEDS, for example, in one of the major um, ones so that, and so, for, and, and get a letter based on that. So, you know, more than just a week with one attending, but let, you know, usually a couple weeks. And so that will be like a, um, a testament to sort of the clinical skills. Now, I didn't mention for the integrated internship or the joint internship, you're automatically guaranteed a spot in, in the um, internship um, once you match in the ophthalmology. So it's it's more it's more for us the letter rather than the internship, but it's just to show that you know you're good with patients, that you thrive in the wards, that you know you take ownership and um, you know so and so that so yeah that's why I recommend a, a, a clinical letter. Because I don't want to what I don't want to see is three research letters, for example. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Beretta. Great. Good to see you. Thank you so much, Dr. Retta, for your wonderful talk. Um, and thank you all to, to everyone who came. Um, and I know we're running over, but we're so grateful um, to have you um, in this program. We do want to ping our next event, which is on glaucoma with Dr. Thomas Johnson at um, from Hopkins. And so that will be on Wednesday, November 11th um, from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern time, so a later start time. And he'll be discussing glaucoma as well as starting a community vision screening program um, as well as his basic um, science research. Future sessions of um, our virtual curriculum will also hopefully be on retina, oculoplastics, global ophthalmology, pediatrics, and other things. And we are, um, as in the past, we'll try to get um, people who are from other schools, non-Hopkins. Um, in the past, we've had Dr. David Friedman from SI and Ear, um, Dr. Tamara Fountain at Rush, and um, Dr. Michael Chang at the National Eye Institute. Um, so stay tuned for that. And we're so grateful to have you and so grateful again um, to Dr. Rada for this wonderful talk. Thank you so much again, Dr. Rada. We really appreciate your talk. It was wonderful. Thank questions you. about whether or not the recording will be sent out. We are going to be sending out the recording. So if you have friends or peers that missed the session but want to learn more, we will be sending all of that along with the Google form for the next session sign up. Thank you all again for joining us. We really hope you guys learned something and we hope to see you guys at our next session. Thank you again to um, our organizers and I'm so glad to see everyone. So there's so much interest in our field. So thank you all.